All right. Uh, doing live streams and videos like this has only been made possible by support from patrons and the like. Uh, I really appreciate it, and I appreciate everybody tuning in and joining me on the streams and uh, sharing ideas for one-page stories. So thanks very much. Okay, let's get down to it. Hi, gang. I have uh, been away. Um, starting a couple minutes early for when I said I would. Don't start. Corbin's with me. Um, and uh, I, I've been really sick. Simple as that. And um, just uh, holidays, when family gets together, I'm highly susceptible to pretty much everything that my grandkids are. Uh, they, they just, whatever they've been exposed to in the petri dish of school, they just pass it right on to me. So it's been uh, a lousy week or so. But here we are, and I have lots and lots of exciting things uh, to show you today. Um, least of which, not least of which, is uh, all these pages that I've been doing while well, uh, well laid out, you know. And uh, but I, I promised some other things to show today too. Um, getting back on my feet, um, I've been, uh, you know going through stuff and I picked up some new mark making materials and uh, I have a sketchbook that's way too big to show you right now it's the largest uh, sketchbook I think I've ever I've ever owned and uh, which is great but at the same time it's a really big sketchbook <laughs> so it's for a project for for someone uh, for a commission and uh, despite that uh, this sucker is yeah so um, anyhow it would take up the whole screen it's uh, uh, what is it three by three and a half feet <laughs> so, something like that anyways hiya yeah Corbin's joined us you want to say hi okay come on say hi everybody how you doing I decided now is the time to harass my dad. All right, there you go. The Corbett visit. That, I should have put that down. I think you should be visiting. Okay, so I got a bunch of stuff that I've detailed. I was going to show. Um, one of which is uh, I got a fun little piece of happy mail here uh, that came from uh, Dee Dee Willingham. I won a draw. I never win draws. I always guess the same number, and I still never win. Um, but. Uh, She's, there's lots of extras for Lori and the kids in here, she says. And uh, this was a draw in relationship to Easter. Um, and so I'll switch to the overhead to show you some of this fun stuff. And then we'll get onto the pages and that in a few minutes. But here, uh, here's all this sort of, these Easter bits of business and uh, bunnies and, and fun things. And so, yeah, so those are going to get passed on to... Uh, to, to Lori and uh, and to the grandkids, uh, and then here's a fun uh, tag that uh, the Dee Dee made. That uh, that's well, that's Lori's. It's got a little flower on it. <coughs> Excuse me. I apologize, but I'm going to be doing that occasionally. My, it's going to take me a while for my uh, lungs to recover. Even though I do feel a lot better today. So, uh, also in that. Uh, package was uh, these three little stints heels and uh, I'm loving them so I'm going to be using these uh, a fair amount I think in different projects but they'll be joining uh, they'll be joining stuff and uh, we'll see where that goes okay what else excuse me <coughs> I'm going to get a drink so um well, like I said, I've been taking it easy and, uh, you know, trying to, uh, to get some stuff done. But uh, I picked up some art supplies as well. You know, I, I upped, uh, upstocked on some of the core things I need um, that I've been going through pretty successfully and uh, picking up just a bunch of different mark making tools and uh, you know just uh, having a good time with all of that um, but and like I said this gigantic sketchbook that unfortunately is way too big to uh, <laughs> to, 
I mean, if I held it up in this frame, it would just cover me. But um, as much as this seems pretty basic, um, when you're going through, when you're finding consistency of, of uses in the stuff that uh, in the stuff that you do, like there's the consistent tools that you're utilizing. Um, it does. There's nothing wrong with replenishing those tools occasionally. It's, is it glamorous? No. Is it exciting? No. But uh, those key things that you use, you don't want to lose a hold of those. So if you need to replace the Fudenosuke pens and things like that. Now, uh, I think, no, I got them here. So in addition to the black Fudenosuke pens, I have been picking up color Fudenosuke pens. And... Uh, Boy, oh boy, let me tell you, this is some exciting stuff because I really, really enjoy the quality of, uh, of the brushed line that I can get with these. And uh, so now to be able to do that drawing with color as well, I'm, I'm looking forward to uh, immensely. And I've been doing some fun sketching in my sketchbooks with uh, that in relationship to Faber-Castells. Um, you know, so I've been, and like I said, I've just pretty simple art supplies to have picked up. Oh, hi, Maritza. Maritza, I didn't uh, see that she'd said uh, hola, hola. Um, and hi to anybody else that's joined us. So, um, so, yeah, so I'm looking forward to using these in the mix of things, but then, of course, these are all the consistent uh, mark making tools that I tend to keep in my little pocketed arsenal. <coughs> Excuse me. So what I mean by that is this. Um, these are little containers that I keep so that when I have to go to uh, an external location, like this week uh, was the London Comic Jam. Now, I couldn't go. I fully intended to go, but I couldn't because uh, I just wanted to make sure that uh, everything was settled with me and that I'm not going to get a bunch more people sick. So my, uh, my my good friend uh, Doug was doing that last night on his own, and really appreciative of, of that. I, I think it was last night. I don't know what day it is. So this is the little smattering of tools, mark making tools, because it's a black and white format that we draw in. And what it is is that somebody starts drawing. Yeah, I'll show you on a piece of paper. Um, someone. And I use a nice, broad, you know, mark, uh, marker here, so that you can see what I'm referring to. Now, if this is a page, okay, of a 12 by 18 paper, all right, and uh, so somebody gets a hold of this page, and they draw the first image, whatever, right here, okay, and this is an all ages event. Bear in mind. So they draw this, and the person might have a little word balloon coming out and soup, I mean, whatever it says. And uh, that's they flip it over, they sign their name on the back, and they're done. And th we tend to only use black and white mark making materials, and the reason for that is that uh, not everybody can accommodate this great diverse range of things, and people are at different levels in their creative journey, and so often people begin with just using black and white. So they uh, they do their panel, flip it over, sign their name on the back, and then slide that to the center of the table. The next person comes along and they take you know their approach and then whatever their tools are and uh, you know and then they do the next panel here and try to have some consistency of whatever the story that started in that first panel by the first person um, they try to have some consistency and follow that along to the next panel and by course of action to the next and they flip it over sign their name in the back and put it in the center of the table next person comes along and you know they they've got similar tools to the first guy so their drawing is going to look very similar you know and, and as far as it goes for mark making the style might be different but so they draw their panel flip it over sign the back so on and so forth until you're done the whole page and so that's what we do each month with the comic jam 
And so this is my little grab bag of, of mark making tools that uh, I bring with me for that. And so I have it in this handy little packaged uh, setup, you know, with this little dollar store pencil, you know, pencil tray. And I've got in here a ballpoint pen, some Fidenis suke pens, right? A um, couple of Sharpies, a nice broad Sharpie for big, large areas to cover. All right, and then I've got a nice, There's that's a roller Sharpie, so it's a fine point, but it's still a Sharpie. And then this uh, selection here is Faber-Castell uh, grays through black um, brush pens, okay? And uh, in addition to that, I've also got a uh, Artist Loft uh, gray, but this is an alcohol, uh, is this an alcohol base or a water base? This is alcohol base. So then, um, and then another black mark making tool randomly. And then I've got these white, there's a Faber-Castell white, there's uh, Posca, small, medium, and uh, a jelly roll pen, white jelly roll. And so this is the little box of, of kit that uh, I'll bring to, that locks up nice, that I'll bring to this jam event. And uh, and that way, uh, and I have another unit twice the size of this, of more of the similar tools. <coughs> Pardon me, for anybody to use that comes along. But having this little kit to carry around with me, uh, nice, you know, compartmentalized. I don't have a lot to drag around with me. Uh, I've, I'm already the guy that has to bring in all the pages and all that other stuff on a regular basis. But this way, as far as it goes for tools, it's uh, there's, you know, a, a number of different things to choose from. But at the same time, it's uh, still not, you know, s there still aren't so many options that I'm just going to get caught up in that, oh, what do I use? You just grab something and go. Now, that bearing in mind, um, I also have this unit. And so this one is, there's some watercolor white. There's a black brush pen. Okay, so this is a Japanese style brush pen. Lovely. Watercolor white. I've got some watercolor brushes here with uh, the water reservoirs inside. These are great. And uh, Didi says, y'all need to throw out a bunch of inexpensive markers on the table for everyone to use. That's exactly what I do, Didi. Um, I have a container that's three times the size of this that's just chock full of all the different tools that I just showed for the most part have a go. If if there's anything out of here that you might need, take it home with you. I say to the, to the kids. So, hi Linda, hi Aditi, uh, hi to anybody I've missed. Um, so this has also got in here some crayon, some pencil crayons, a couple different kinds of pencil crayons. There's the Prismacolor, and then there's the uh, Faber Fa Pastels. And I got a uh, pencil holder with a number of different colored LEDs for color erase pencils and this is a lacquer uh, coated solid graphite pencil so and then of course these different cup uh, bits of color pen that I've shown you these uh, Faber Castell and the Fidena Suke colored brushes uh, colored brush pen so I uh, I have this as well for myself so that uh, you know you don't, I don't always have to stick to black and white, but if I'm traveling, that's my whole toolkit that I'm taking for the most part. <coughs> you know, and maybe a fountain pen, stuff like that, ballpoint pen. But when we're approaching something like this, we've been doing this since 2015, um, it sort of helps people to figure out storytelling, and, it's, and it helps people to start to develop um, an understanding of picking up narrative, you know, and carrying it on. So without being overly concerned about those, I'm not as good a drawer, I'm not as good a, a writer. We forego all of those sort of beliefs and, and say, you know, we're all learning. We're all in different processes of learning. So feel unencumbered to, 
to, to be able to do the thing that you do and everybody else will be respectful of it. And it's been a lot of fun, you know? We've uh, really enjoyed doing that. But uh, yeah, um, uh, like Dee Dee says, you throw a big old bunch of inexpensive mark making tools in the middle of the table and with uh, sheets of paper and half uh, started comic pages with people and people tend to dive in, you know? They tend to, uh, they tend to give it a go. But the wonderful thing about it is, is that often these people will do things that uh, might be outside of their comfort zone or might be outside of the typical approach that they take. I only do science fiction. Well, the, the girl beside, um, you know, the girl that only does science fiction, well, she only draws rabbits. So now you're going to see some kind of smattering of science fiction rabbit story. You know, and, uh, you know, the boy beside them likes to, you know, do the cowboy turtles, whatever. And, you know, and so that's, it's all of those things are going to get sort of smelt into that smelting pot. And you're going to see that narrative grow and develop in ways that it wouldn't if one, each one of those individuals was working by themselves. So, uh, Suzanne's joined us. How are you doing, Suzanne? Welcome aboard. What motivates you to do that? <coughs> um, I'm largely motivated by, um, I, uh, we, we were thinking about this again recently. Um, this uh, it's always been a, uh, a thing for me to look at in, in the journey of my own creative career if I'm stepping over obstacles and stepping over hurdles on my career why would I not try to encourage and direct people on what I did so that they can overstep those hurdles and obstacles themselves maybe a little bit easier because I, you know, I'm, I'm sort of saying this, hey, this way has been working. Come on, this way. That's a sort of strange example of it, but um, when it comes to, you know, uh, showing in galleries, I would, I would, uh, any of my friends and, and, and other artists that I knew that were looking for opportunities, I would always encourage them and say, well, I had this show at this gallery, and here's the contact people, and and there's an opportunity you might want to pursue, or if there's exhibitions coming up, I'd pass those on. If there's jobs that would come up, uh, commissions and stuff that uh, I went, didn't have the time for, I'd pass those on. I've always done this sort of thing, is my point. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, and then when it came to the comic company that we started in 2015, um, the money that was being made off of the production of my books that I write and illustrate, we started putting aside to set up a second, a secondary stream of publishing. And that secondary stream of publishing, we set up an anthology. And so anybody that gave us four page short stories that wanted to be published, this was an opportunity for them to be done so. Um, and that way, they can go and learn all the things that they want to learn about the process. If I not got live chat on, I'm so sorry. Um, oh, sorry, Didi, I'll, gra I'll grab your question in a second. Throw a bunch of uh, Didi said, I missed, not, I mean colors. Oh yeah, no, Didi, I, uh, the, uh, there's all kinds of gray tones and stuff like that, but we tend to stick to the black and white largely because of reproduction stuff. Sorry, I didn't get to that question. Uh, do I have new people every time? Same people come back. We've had s we've had some of the same people coming back for since 2015, and we get new people all the time. We've had kids start with us that are now in in, uh, in art college and university, and uh, or or just w or in working in the field. And we've had young people that are now fully on adults and and you know we've got families that bring their kids and then the kids become teenage it's a strange thing but uh we're an all-age event and we keep it safe and no effing and a jeff or weird socio sexual psycho political hang-ups and this stuff just keep all that you know free and clear so it's it, it tends to be open for people so yeah thank you for asking that Didi. Anyhow, so when we started doing a comic company, immediately I started opening up opportunities for people other than myself. And I'll, you know, here, 
all I needed to do is cover the cost of production and here's copies go promote yourself and say look at somebody else who's already published me and uh, and through that um, RP Comics the comic company that we've uh, started um, we're about to put out books 74 and 75 74 is uh, Tim Frazier's Bucket of Frogs and uh, and then 75 is the uh, announcement that I have for, for everybody this week and I'll be showing you that announcement um, but uh, I have a new book coming out so uh, yeah the 75 books now and uh, about 250 people the comic jams still go we did 16 apartments anthologies alone it, it just it it grows itself and it starts to develop and build a sense of community and so how these things work together is with the comic jam I'm sort of introducing people to comic storytelling dynamics and people start with doing these interactive pages they move to doing single pages on their own then they start doing four page shorts eight page shorts full books and uh, and now we've got people that are getting uh, um, editorial sessions with Marvel and, and uh, DC so that's kind of fun that started with doing this this way and good for them that's their path they want to follow <coughs> excuse me you know and working for other small publishers and stuff so um, but that starts there the comic producing uh, RP comics we published the jams, we published the anthologies, we published, uh, I went on to start doing solo books for people, but realized that those books are only as successful as those people self-promote themselves, and uh, there's the funny thing about artists and writers, 100% of them want to make stuff, but a very small percent of them want to do what they have to do to promote that stuff, and, and, and can make that connection to, you know, promoting and supporting their own work and uh, encouraging others to engage in it because that's the part where there's a reason we, we create things and that's because that's our form of communication. These other forms of communication like marketing and promotion aren't necessarily top of the mind for, for a lot of creatives and so that's understandable. So we're not doing so many solo books, uh, only if it's people that I know that are going to take it in hand and run with it. So um, and Tim's uh, new book is, is going to be fun. He's doing it under the RP banner and Derek Latimer did a couple, and uh, yeah, so it's a lot of fun. But, uh, and then what I do with the one page stories is similar in, in the same regard because sharing the opportunity with everybody out there to say, suggest a one page story idea or three word prompts or some kind of suggestion, uh, and uh, we'll make a, a one page story from it. Encourages it. Uh, everybody out there to engage in the process of creativity in maybe a little more unfettered way than, than they would comfortably do so otherwise because well what if it's I don't do it in, in whatever regard and it's not it doesn't look in whatever way I want it to look you don't need to worry about any of that stuff what's the idea let's explore it and whatever that idea suggestion might be it doesn't necessarily mean that I'm going to do it that way because let's be honest I'm weird so but it's an opportunity for engagement and interaction and hopefully in the process of doing these videos where we talk about this stuff and I show you examples of stuff and uh, and then you encouraging uh, you're encouraging natures and joining me in and in, in making some pages um, hopefully that instigates creativity the spark inside and, 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 and hopefully people are getting uh, all juiced up to have some fun enough of my jibber jabber I got a couple things to show you um, two, two things oh the other thing I forgot to show you is this this I got a whole bunch of new 12 by 18 cardstock paper ah large and shiny and thick as all get out mixed media paper folks so I can really abuse this alright I brought some books um, now there's uh, some something fun about different approaches and different ways of cracking open the lid on visual and textual storytelling, sequential storytelling. Tank Girl's one of them. 
uh, and uh, if you get a chance, it's it's pretty uh, avant-garde. It's uh, but this is the guy who went on to design the Gorillas, and so this is a punk rock uh, magazine that went on to change the face of of indie comics. Now there might be some language or some awkward weirdness. But that's the whole point in showing you this. Like this is photostatted images that somebody's made something of, and you know, and then here he's got uh, different illustrative styles that he approaches and zipatone and stuff like that that he uses. And so this is long before he goes on to create, uh, you know, the gorillas with uh, Damon Alburn from Blur. But here's designs for his the tank for Tank Girl and the characters and this is stuff that's in relationship to the movies, you know, just really interesting artistic style, and uh, and yet you see me checking pages because I don't want to show you anything that's shocking because he's it's quirky and it's punk rock and it's silly, but um, yeah, you know, just good good stuff, good fun in general. There's Booga, her boyfriend's a mutant kangaroo. Don't ask. But this is a uh, this is a great book. It's the art, uh, the art and craft of a comics icon, Tank Girl. Hewlett Martin and ISBN is nine seven eight one eight four five seven six nine four two zero. So if you like punk rock aesthetic and you like um, an alternative way to storytelling in comics and and irreverence, you might like Tank Girl. Now, uh, in a similar vein is Ben Caldwell and this is Ben Caldwell's Dare Detectives he has a very cartoony uh, motion picture kind of a a style of drawing and uh, and yet that's a cute Green Reaper that's a cutie um, he's a very fine storyteller but this uh, this came up his sketchbook which is just pages and pages and pages of of, of um, creative explorations of uh, similar in how I start pages and never finish them and, and uh, you know and uh, I do the just make basic workups and move on to something else and then the third fourth page is completely finished uh, that, yeah, I, I understand that so but it's also got a lot of his sketch work and rough ideas look at these menacing monkeys oh my goodness those are menacing monkeys so yeah, so Ben Caldwell's, if you can find sketchbooks like this by artists that are so just completely free and that he's exploring developing characters, he's exploring developing story points and, and you know, scenarios and things like that. This is the, this is, uh, this is the sort of sketchbooks that I look forward to seeing. In all honesty, I would sooner see this process of the scribbled line drawing of the basic forms to the finished image in two steps like that then a book of finished images to be perfectly honest so lots of stuff Ben Caldwell the dare detectives this was a Kickstarter book I don't have an ISBN or do I I don't so uh, but you can if you look up the bootleg edition of Ben Caldwell Stair Detectives. Uh, he does these port like he does these sketchbooks every year. He puts one of these out every year. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, in fact, even more than that. I think this is number thirty-five. Okay. So next up. So I've shown Frazetta before. Frazetta uh, is uh, one of these absolute uh, masters of craft. He designed Vampirella anybody that doesn't uh, isn't familiar. So, but this is all about his sketches, right? The Living Legend is about a lot of his black and white work, and you can do an awful lot with black and white, folks. But uh, I'm going to pull in on the, the, the other camera to show you this because of the delicate nature of these lines. Now, the amount of control to show this fantastic distinction in value it just shows you he has a real capability with his with his with his tools and taking the time 
to pursue the image and a really strong understanding of black contrasting elements in, in the drawings look at these black uh, waves coming up behind this young lady on the shoreline here on a rock or something I think she is that's just a strong strong application of light and there's the plane she crashed in here's the plane she crashed in there is the sort of idea that it's being consumed by the waves and then the waves so there's a nice progression in that but just beautiful work and uh, you know some pictures of Frank and the early stuff but then we get into here we go some of his black and, and white work and again here's another really fine example of a uh, sense of uh, understanding of contrasting values just great stuff and uh, here's there's a, another one with a, a Roman soldier being brought before this horde of monsters you know he uh, a lot of sword and sorcery stuff that's a that's a Conan cover I think or, no, or is that a Tarzan that's a Tarzan cover that he did from one of the ace books but look at this this weft of line look at all that shape language going on in there to draw your eye around and focus you right here on the main man so you know just really great stuff a lot of study work for his paintings um, a lot of self you know self-portrait work in there as he's as he's uh, you know figuring out the line making incorporates himself into his, his compositions all the time look at the uh, leopard taking down a gazelle I mean that's just great stuff just great stuff lots of Tarzan book covers here look at this there's a uh, warrior uh, jungle lady that's coming to attack this pterodons and saber-toothed tiger that are harassing this poor defenseless space cowboy just wonderful stuff and uh, ISBN on this is 978-0-960-706-006 I brought this years ago so I don't know how easy it is going to be cut to it's going to be defined and as is the usual and taking a leap to a completely different direction I pull back out again here this is Katsua, Katsuya Tarada Dragon Girl and Monkey King I just want to show you this is black and white work but look at all of the values that he's getting out of that look at all the, the he's got a golden rod because that's what the monkey king's weapon was was a staff of gold but he's got uh, so many crazy crazy images like this and it's a very interesting style it's a very complex style of drawing he's uh, you know got an Asian background in, uh, in art and a sensibility you know but at the same time like there's just such wonderful complex images in this that's uh, I think the Assassin's Creed thing and then of course your sci-fi babes but I just I really enjoy I really enjoy his sense of tone I really do and uh, there's just something lovely about that and again a, a very big departure from the previous people that we're looking at but you can see from a really sketchy underground kind of a vibe you know, to uh, really fine refined uh, line like Frank Zeta, uh, Frazetta to this absolute just complete tonal control here like it's just it's really it's really compelling you know to see the differences the different leaps that we all take creatively in our exploration so okay um, one more thing to show you and then I'm gonna get on with what I'm gonna get on with there is um, I've posted so I've been sick for I don't know how long about a week maybe and uh, week and a half yeah Corbin says week and a half and um, so but I've been producing stuff while I've been 
laid up. And so I just thought, because I posted most of this on my Patreon, uh, a lot of it didn't appear on Instagram or Facebook. I showed today, with today's post, a couple of thumbnail images that have all these pages on them that, uh, you know, the majority of which you haven't seen. But, um, so the image that you see here, conspiracy, so what I've done is I've taken another swing at just trying a, f a sort of application to producing pages for an experiment of, kind of, a, of a type. So this is me going through old sketchbooks and finding random images and then trying to stitch together something from those so that, you, you know, a lot of these sketches and things that we do, they don't go anywhere. We don't use those for anything else. So I thought I'd give this a try. So here are some of these pages and um, and so there's the one that I posted today conspiracy but uh, included in that now this one I haven't put the rest of the text up on for whatever reason but uh, this is a, an old mixed media image that I did on paper with tape and uh, and paint and pencil and of a, a local Canadian artist named Jack Chambers who is honestly one of my uh, influences artistically. He's one of my heroes. He's uh, also a filmmaker. <coughs> Excuse me. I've shown his stuff on, on the stream before. And then here is me utilizing all of these images throughout these sketchbooks and, you know, conforming them to the same, you know, uh, color value system. Like these are all different colored illustrations and stuff like that in the books like the the error the the squirting bottle and the big smudge behind the guy is in red ink and I've transferred it all to this sort of golden value hi how are you um so there's this one there's paradigm which is again exploring a different story type of uh of storytelling from a, a number of uh, ballpoint pen drawings but you know again uh, you trying to tie them together uniformly through color application you know, same color uh, to the line art same uh, color for the general tonality of the piece and, and trying to find something that the, the story is about light and dark and so I wanted to play with the idea of light and dark value. You're not helping. I'm not helping. Down. So, biting, biting things. He's biting. So, <coughs> here's a, another completely different approach to it. I've taken these different mixed media uh, modified surface drawings. Like the, You can see there's lines through the, the earth because of different textured papers and uh, and then there's whole sections of this second uh, large panel image that aren't even there anymore like they're just I just wiped it because it's just text I write I draw I write over my drawings all the time and uh, and so here I am taking all of this silly business and, and stitching together you know a still a silly silly narrative about some of the ridiculousness in our dreams you know, like the guy with his whole, you know, his whole, suppose, just nonsense. And, uh, and then satellite is a bunch of images stitched together again into a different narrative about how, you know, a collection of images gathered from, from one, a singular source can give us an overview of stories that they might tell us. So you look in a, if you look at a bunch of images laid out like this, the story that you stitch together from these static images is not going to be the same as the story that somebody else stitches together. However, it's it's like detective work. Detectives, when they come to a crime scene, they have to stitch together what might have happened for that crime um, based on the, whatever evidence, whatever traces they have of something to put together. And uh, textless, textless stories, is, that's pretty much what that's like. These are mixed media drawings on paint and then uh, cut out and stuck down here um, with a little bit of text hole unifying it all. Uh, this is two 
sets of drawings layered over top of each other. So it's a bunch of scribbly faces um, and and forms, human forms, and and it's also a whole bunch of different um, drawings of the sky in clouds and one laid over top of the other. <coughs> Excuse me, a uniform uh, color system implemented again so that the different pencil drawings and whatever different colors or whatever different uh, uh, like sometimes you know, you know you'll do a pencil drawing and, and you'll use light pressure on it and so the lines won't be so dark and then another time you'll far more pressure far far more distinct line work and you sort of just got to sort of tie those on a flat level so that one doesn't one image doesn't overpower the next panel and then uh, just tying it together you know about cloud looking when you're looking up at clouds and you see all kinds of shapes and things there's all kinds of stories in clouds these ones that I'm depicting are just a little weirder um, I also do a thing in sketchbooks where I will draw unseemly amounts of little figural people and uh, just trying to understand form and how people stand and at rest and how our legs and our shoulders and, 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 and all of our parts move in conjunction with one another and just trying to find the different shapes of people and that we're all not a uniform um, size or, uh, or um, weight, you know. So this is me playing with that and then, uh, you know, when you start laying all these down on there, it gets really crowded really quickly. Well, it's kind of, that I like that in, um, that tying together of all of these people um, on this page feels a little crowded and I had this map I'd drawn of a of a, a piece of Europe and uh, I thought well why don't we lay that over top Europe's pretty populated it's a little crowded <laughs> and that's how my logic works folks <laughs> so I laid all these guys again uniform uh, value so I make all of the little people the same color and then there's a uniform value to the land behind them. And I put the one layer over top of the other. And then I try to find a sort of associative balance of colors that work together like this, the green, the brown, the yellow, and find a comfort, a comfortable, at least comfortable to me, um, association of color to, to, you know, to tie that image together. And at the same time, lift all those figures up off of that background. Um, but how much the viewer gets out of an image like this, I don't know. And it's not for me to be concerned about. I make the visual statement as I make it. And I could write a paragraph long, you know, description of what the piece is about or what the reference is towards. And, and try to make some sort of explanation, <coughs> pardon me, that validates the image. Or I can just let people make their own interpretation because they might have something I didn't think of. One way or another, if they just think, maybe that's pretty, that works too. This is the first one I showed you, Conspiracy. And this is from a lot of pencil black pencil crayon studies of classic paintings and uh, and st uh, statues um, and then putting together a narrative about uh, hey conspiracies right it's all true it's cool steeper for and then you know like there's we just self-validate things all the time uh, this is playing with a couple of different notions about when I lay out pages so the top part of this page with all of these small panels of um, perspectives and locations and little notes scribbled around them that, you know, this could be utilized in such a way or this way. Those, those little forays into your imagination, they can be used in so many different ways that you might not at, at first consider so if you have the affordance of opportunity to allow yourself to drift off and spend a little bit of time 
do so, right? Um, and then who knows what you can do with it later, like this. Now, Suzanne has asked, black and white or color, which do I prefer? I don't have a preference. Um, I thought about this a lot. I don't, I just don't. <laughs> Um, I think if there's a tool that I have a, a strange comfort in, in using, it might be ballpoint pen. I draw a lot in ballpoint pen, but as far as it goes for black and white or color, I draw with colored pens all the time, so I don't, but I appreciate the question, and I just don't have a, a clear thing. I'm too transient in one medium to another. and honestly mixing a whole bunch of them together and now I've started doing the same thing with traditional media and digital media and incorporating those two aspects together as much as I am so I but I appreciate the question I just wish I had a, a more clear answer uh, this is where are we now there's the cart this is just silliness but it, I think it's a valid argument is take a good look at cards is not such a big deal it's lots of cards yeah. what just sit down there's your spot leave me alone uh i just thought it's fun to draw a guy pulling his cart and, and using a jetpack and then you know the story sort of built itself around that <laughs> but it's carl carl's carts carl's jetpack yeah why the heavy accent on the narration? I don't. I don't know. Just thought it'd be fun. Uh, this uh, I'll get to in one sec. I'll come back to this, okay? But this is what ended up being a two-page story about the most dangerous man alive, and it's about um, us as the viewer. And, and and us as and you know this is from our perspective the story as we are going into this maximum security prison of some kind where they keep this little old fella reading his book and uh, and uh, we're warned off quite severely about don't tell him anything because uh, words have power and he uh, you hear of a magician? <laughs> so, I, so this was a fun piece. Um, and uh, it was a study for a character that I was going to use in a book. And then uh, I really enjoyed that top panel here where I figured out how to do this, this friskalating uh, mark making up there to make it feel like there's a diffused light in this prison cell. And uh, the, the text up on the walls and, and the backgrounds that start appearing here is purposeful because it fits along with this guy who's called The Book. Okay, so, uh, and then this page. <coughs> Elmwood is a series that I did that uh, I did 11 books of. Oh, I've got a question. I'll get into this in a second. You scan your pages. Do you feel you got a lot of adjustments to make to achieve the colors, the original, or details? No. Um, I tend to scan whatever I've got, and I don't overthink too much about uh, results when I'm working. Um, if I've shown some of my sketchbooks here about a thousand times, I think, but when I'm sketching out ideas, and I'll switch over to this for a second. So here's a page. It's a little washed out, and I apologize for that. A little better? Maybe not. So here's a page that I pretty much just drew flat, scanned it, and then colored it digitally. Whereas this is a page that uh, I'll be putting up that has all kinds of fun stuff that I've done with it. And uh, uh, so that I even finished drawing the last panel digitally just because I felt like switching over to the other approach and it's uh, yeah they do the thriller dance so buckle up you'll be seeing that that'll be this will be popping up on patreon soon but when I'm drawing and I'm just exploring whatever I'm exploring and I'll use colored mark making tools or I'll use black and white mark making tools or just whatever it doesn't matter to me 
and uh, I'm just drawing to draw. And oftentimes I'll pick elements out of uh, like this wheel, and I'll scan that, and I'll clean that wheel up, and I'll put that in a composition be because I was so inspired to do so. So there's an awful lot of adjustment that I'm constantly making on whatever I'm doing. I appreciate that. That's a fun question. Um, you know, you help me realize something there, Susanna. So uh, with, uh, with that, you know, I'll just switch things to a black and white, like a black line art for these pencil, these colored pencil drawings. Or I'll, uh, you know, um, do all kinds of modification to it in equal measure digitally. Uh, there's no rhyme or reason on what specific path I'm on. And I don't pre-plan things. I tend to uh, intuit, you know, my artsy-fartsy decisions as I go. Uh, because that sort of keeps it loose and open. It, but it's also why the pages that I do, while you can see an underlying similarity, it's also why the pages that I do are Heather and Yon and, and he did that. That's a completely different executed page in the previous one. Okay, this is uh, from. I did. I'll uh, get my face off here for a sec so you can see the whole thing. Well, I did a series of books called Elmwood, and uh, I did 11 so far. And then I dropped off. Bef this is before COVID. This is about 2017 or 2018 was the last time I did an, uh, an Elmwood book. And I realized that to go back and do the twelfth book and finish the whole storyline off, there's been so much change in my storytelling approach and my storytelling ability and my visual ability that I basically need to go back and, and do some sort of synoptic way of telling the story from the first eleven issues within the confines of the twelfth and just release that as just a larger volume of a book. So this would have been from the first book that was Elmwood Boy Built Synthetic. And um, it's about a mad scientist who creates a synthetic woman. And, uh, you know, she, as much as, you know, he, he thinks that, uh, oh, I've created the ideal gal, well, as soon as uh, she sees some, some trees from the window of the, lo of the lab that she's been created in, well, she wants to go and see the trees. So, you know, he gets home from his excursion and has to find her, figure out where she went. And so it's, it's a silly story, but it's introducing two characters that introduce us into a larger cast. But by the time I got to issue 12, I've got two large groups of individuals that are about to and uh, face off and, and uh, the big conflagration of events that are all leading up to good guys versus bad guys and uh, when I look at it now the approach that I I'm, would take to it would be vastly different but I just thought I'd play with uh, an approach to retelling the Elmwood stories and thought maybe I'll just do the single page. This is basically this single page is basically about what the first book was about, and, and you know, and so forth for each book. Um, and then I realized in doing this, it sort of it scratched that itch, but also became evident to me that no, I need to do some kind of a little more structure to that narrative, and to tie it together like someone is giving us an overview of a sequence of events as opposed to the confusion of page by page events. So this is uh, drawn in green pencil, scanned, dumped into the robot, and, uh, and then finished digitally. So there's a whole bunch of silly, fun things that I've done in here. And errare uh, es humanum esic de similibus. Just like that. <coughs> okay, so that's uh, the ten pages that I've done in the last few days. In the last uh, four or five days, I've just been once. Yeah, I was able to sit up. I just wanted to get crack a lacking. So 
and assembling a bunch of uh, images and, and composition and compositional elements together and trying to find story for that it tends to be uh, allow you to assemble things in a, in a more quick way it's kind of like the same as when people are scrapbooking right and uh, collaging so uh, before uh, I get into the book um, again I'll, I'll put forward the the old request if uh, let's see where is that it I think that's it bang do you have a one-page comic idea <laughs> <laughs> um, if you've got a one-page story idea, if you've got uh, three word prompts that you want to, to, to tell me or anything like that, uh, an idea that you think uh, you want to suggest towards me, I'm not interested in doing full scripts, and I'm not, uh, and if you're like, on the first panel, do this, and then on the second panel, I'm not doing that either. But if, uh, if you've got an idea or, uh, or a suggestion or a piece of dialogue, or three words, whatever it is, and you want to suggest that, please feel free to do so in the comments uh, for this video or in the comments of uh, any of the posts that I do. And uh, so I try to show Monday through Friday, I try to show a page a day there um, because I produce at least a page a day this way. And uh, on Patreon, I show the weekend pages and more. So, uh, but just like that's what a lot of this stuff that you just saw is was only shown on Patreon, and it's you know, it's, I know it's three dollars a month and stuff, but it's like three dollars for thirty-one images, not bad. Um, okay, so I've got the book open. This is where I write down a lot of these cool cat suggestions that come in, and. Uh, and then as I'm flipping through, I'll just arbitrarily pick something, and then that's the story that we're doing that day. And, uh, <coughs> excuse me, I don't get too concerned about it, uh, but what uh, medium that I'm going to use to, to do a story or anything like that. So if there's something that people uh, would be interested in seeing me use, let me know. Um, you okay? Peace in touch. Mr. Sneezy Magoo beside me over there. Um, okay. Little tubbies are Power Rangers in their larval form. <laughs> Such a weird one. The circle of life from a pencil. Backcountry families that seem to first hillbilly are secretly superior scientists and have subterranean advanced cultures. An easy one. <laughs> If I make light of it, I have to prove. All right, so we'll do this. This is uh, this is today's suggested idea. I'll write it down on this piece of paper, and then I'll walk through uh, some ideas about this. So it's a. Are you gonna work? No. Why would you work? Are you working? I really beat up pens. Back country families so this is our suggestion and I for whatever reason have not got it written down hiya Barbara how are ya <coughs> excuse me <coughs> welcome aboard back country families that seem you'll work there we are that seem at first hillbilly are secretly superior scientists scientists and subterranean good heavens Mediterranean advanced cultures. I'll show you where this came from. Well, there's our suggestion today. And uh, we'll get uh, generating some ideas for this. This is fun. I like stories like this that take um, a confined notion, like you, you expect things to be this way, but they take it someplace else. 
Uh, Barbara says, surviving Christopher, thanks. Oh, wonderful. I'm glad to hear it, Barbara. So I'm sorry I don't have whose suggestion that is, but if it's you, let me know. We'll give you uh, credit here. I, I apologize for whatever reason I didn't write down whoever this came from. But I get ideas sometimes thrown at me. Oh, do this! And uh, that'll be out somewhere. And so I'll pull this booklet out of my back pocket and scribble it in there. And I have no idea who said what. So bear with me. I apologize, folks. Um, okay, so backcountry families that see at first hillbilly are secretly superior scientists and are subterranean advanced cultures. <coughs> Barbara says, Hillbilly, is that dueling banjos playing in the background? Yeah, why not? Um, let's think about that. Uh, I would suggest, um, well, how about we just imagine uh, coal miner's daughter, Loretta Lynn, um, and the way that she, um, when she would regale us with tales about her upbringing in, uh, in the mountains uh, from a mining community, and an, an, an impoverished mining community. She really uh, clearly exampled what uh, what it was to grow up in that in that uh, type of low locale. Uh, here's something a lot of people don't know. Okay, in the Americas, uh, the Americas, New York, Delaware, down the coast, all the way to Florida, da, 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 Cuba, um, anyways, so, and here we go up into Nova Scotia, Newfoundland, Prince Edward Island, anyways. This section here is the Appalachian mountain range. And so for the longest time, I don't know if people knew this, and I'm just so full of pointless and useless information that I paraphrase and get half correct. So when people came over, right, the, this section of America is heavily influenced by Germanic people. But when people would come across, okay, from Europe, you had an awful lot of, of uh, higher caliber Scottish and Irish and English that would be coming into places like the original, uh, so many American states and the original uh, so much of Upper Canada, and and so as lesser quality communities or lowland people or or you know the uh, societally considered less desirables would come down. Those boats were often redirected this way and this way, and so there's a real distinctness in the culture here and here that is so much different than here. And yet at the same time, very similar. And so the French that went up this way in Quebec are also the same French that are down here that became the Creole. So, you know, welcome to art and history. I saw a meme, I don't take the road less traveled. Have you seen Deliverance? <laughs> That's terrible. <laughs> yeah, yes, I've seen Deliverance. <laughs> That's a Burt Reynolds film that makes people reconsider. <laughs> Hello, Jim. Welcome aboard. Hello, Captain and crew, he says. So anyhow, so you have dialects and you have certain cultural um, applications in these areas. Like in these areas, education, right, and communication was considered more important. And because of these are lowland Scottish, uh, settlers and and Irish and and uh, um, French and and you know all these people being redirected this way to the um, have to foray into these new lands and and continue to build up and develop America. Um, you know you get real pockets of different dialectics and so much so that one valley will sound completely different from the next one and it has everything to do with the way that their cultural situation works of clans and, and, and a tribal system that moved over from, from Europe. Because the Picts, I don't know if people realize this, but the Picts, or what eventually became the Scots, 
are the aboriginals of Britain. So, anyhow, this is, uh, that's why I said dueling banjos. So, by the way, for, for your information, right about here is, uh, is where deliverance took place. So, yeah, so that's why you'll have people that will speak in Byrie, Clare, Wise, and it's, and it's um, hodgepodge dialectics of, of the different accents of the different culturals that are smashing together and uh, that are coming from those regions over there. But that's why you'll see such a distinct difference here and here from this area here. And what we in Canada call Newfies and Newfoundlanders and Labradors and, and Scotias they're very similar culturally because they're from the same place and they're the same people as uh, down here in the United States. Oh, the useless stuff I'm full of. <clears throat> so yeah, so there you go. Oh yeah, back to this. So our suggestion is backcountry families that seem at first hillbilly are secretly superior scientists and subterranean advanced cultures. So in the spirit of Barbara's love of hillbillydom and Burt Reynolds movies. Well, uh, let's let's explore this. Don't forget the Ewok, says Jim. Yup, yup, Jim. Yup, yup. Cannibals. Cannibal teddy bears, those Ewoks. I'm telling you right now. Realize that they're playing music on the, on the helmets. Of, uh, of dead uh, stormtroopers that uh, and they're uh, right beside their giant fire pit where everybody's having something to eat for dinner. We don't know those uh, Ewoks. Anyhow, so if this is our page, <coughs> now let's let's start off with this. Do people want me to draw today's page portrait or landscape? First vote wins. Portrait. Or landscape. I don't mind doing either one. So we got backcountry families at first. See my first hillbilly, our secret superior scientists, and subterranean advanced cultures. Uh, I had a friend who learned to play banjo while we had a studio together, and uh, so I'd go jing 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 on my guitar and she'd go ding ding ding. <laughs> People around us loved us. All right, so. All right, I'll just go with portrait because it's right here. So if this is our page, switch to a uh, easier to see tool. Is landscape an option? There you go. Just because Barbara, we're gonna do landscape. You did this to yourself, Barbara. All right. So we're doing landscape. This is planned scape right here. Portrait and landscape. So we're going to tell our story starting on this uh, uh, point and to this point. Just the same as we would if it was a landscape. Just the same as we go point, 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 point if it was a portrait. Now we're going to do this whole page on an angle just for Barbara. Um, so if we introduce our setting, our location, we can do it. We can have a fun bit of business by breaking our panels up diagonally across the page like this. And, uh, and so we can start, you know, we'll draw in the mountains and then we'll draw a scene of some shacks and business going down into a valley, right? And uh, little lights in the, in the cabins. And then we can have, uh, uh, what am I missing? How's the project going, Jim? Jim, do you have all messages set up on your thing? Jim also, uh, or live, live chat or all messages, yeah. Um, Planscape, I better write that down before I forget, Barbara. And that's for Barbara, Barbara. Anyways, so if we start with mountains, and then we'll move into, uh, into the valley, and then we can have, uh, we'll do an image that cuts across here again, but we're gonna play with the depth of field. I'm sorry, I moved that down. We're gonna play with the depth of field a lot here. And what I mean by that is, I'm going to, sorry, I'm going to uh, 
draw a couple old fellers sitting on a, a porch and one of them will be playing a banjo. But ding 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 ding. And then we'll we'll have uh, you know we can even push that up inside of this image, but just to make it a little more visually interesting. So and then we'll have some kids playing here, you know, hoop. So maybe one will be playing hoop or whatever it is, but we'll have a couple of kids carrying on. You know, just more of the environment around them. So there's our hillbillies. <laughs> now we will zoom in. There you go. So then we can have uh, play with uh, a couple of more design ideas. And so what I thought I might do is have a couple of the hillbilly characters, like the kid in overalls, going, "Oh, what you doing here?" You know, and those cliches, and also we'll have these two kids looking at the the view. And again, we'll put some more characters in the environment itself. And and then we'll well what we'll do is we'll switch it up, and so we'll put some different. Uh, we'll do a different panel. We'll have one of the kids say, "Come on!" As he runs off, and we follow him along. I'll figure out how to break up these panels in a sec. Uh, everyone is whittling. <laughs> Make sure to have somebody whittling, Dee Dee. <laughs> Check it out, a mighty cougar. Anyways, Jim says the movie is coming along. I'm in the last quarter. If anybody got an, um, a, gets a chance, check out Jim's um, chat that he does on his on his. Uh, his channel here on on YouTube where he talks he has a series of videos called hey man how's your movie going and he talks about the process of making his film and there was a lot of announcements in that last one that he had so it was a lot of fun to, uh, he had Gary and, and Paul Gary Hodges Paul Pate and myself as guests the jibber jabber it was fun um, so here he is he's gonna lead us down and uh, and then we'll draw a forest trail put some trees, kick around it, and uh, and then we can even do some fun signs maybe on those trees, like, keep out, shush now, uh, this ain't for you, you know? <laughs> whatever silliness we, um, we come up with, so well, there's the kids, this way, and then forest path, and signs. So this is this is a really fast way to blah, rough out a plot, right? And then uh, and then we'll have them. <coughs> we'll have them. Uh, I'm trying to think of another cliche. Moonshine. Moonshine. We could have them. Let's find uh, old Uncle Ned's lean-to moonshine shed he's got going there. And uh, we'll have him pointing towards it. There! <laughs> so here's the moonshine shed. And then one of the, uh, another fun way that we can break up these panel splits is that as we put these trees dividing up because there's so many f you know trees in this forested mountainous region that we can use those as a panel divider and so th we can silhouette them out by the time we get into this next panel where you know he's uh, he's letting us in to the tent or into the shed, I'm so sorry. And then civil so draw, there's the door opening up. And uh, what now? We want to, we've got the first half, but back county, or back country families that seem at first hillbilly are secretly superior scientists and subterranean advanced cultures. 
And we're doing it in Planescape, which is half portrait, half landscape. Barbara came up with that. Please just be careful you don't put the moonshine shed next to the outhouse. It's funny, Barbara, that you say that because initially I thought, well, I'll put an outhouse. And then I went, no, that's just moonshine shed. <laughs> so, yeah, I wasn't too far off from making that mistake. So here he is, he brings us in. And, uh, and then we can have him, uh, I, I think that maybe we'll have him pull down a, a cover on the wall. And then we'll have a reveal here of a keypad. Right? A little nine button keypad. Little finger, punky poop, poop, poop. So, um, shed inside cover and then keypad so there's our breakdown for that layer and uh, so then I guess it's uh, that's you know we're kind of set, uh, setting ourselves with a limited amount of space so maybe I want to move this up and to a thin panel going across here and we'll have the kid just a yak and away. Yak and a yak, yak, yak. And then we'll have the, is this an elevator? You know, and then, yeah, of course it is. Where'd you think it was? You said you won't talk my pa. You know, and then, um, <laughs> it's a conspiracy. Conspiracy chicken. So we'll have this thin panel. And then as he goes, see? And he'll hold his hand out like so. And he looks out at, at the viewer. And then I get to spend all of this space, this bottom corner of the page, I'll make it be a little more spacious there, move some of this up. Um, and then I get to draw crazy subterranean sci-fi city here. See? And then subterranean sci-fi. Well, there we go. Now we've quickly blocked out our our narrative. We're trying to incorporate elements of of her suggestion. Back county families, back country families. I'm sorry, that seem at first hillbilly, are secretly superior scientists in subterranean and advanced cultures. So we've got them, all these cliches. We're fitting the mountains, the valley with the shacks, the hillbillies going about whittling and banjo. And then the kids, and his word, you're here to talk my pa. All right, I'll show you where he is. Um, and then uh, away we go uh, to having him lowering him down in the moonshine shed and taking him to the secret underground sci-fi city that's built inside the mountain. See, that's the kind of funny uh, idea that, you, you know, when as soon as you start onto this path, you know, narratively, this story could go so much so much further you know but at least we got a breakdown to the start of it and uh, and that's a lot of fun uh, Didi says I did my share who writes this stuff it's supposed to say see pa <laughs> good night John boy <laughs> anyways I did my share of conspiracy projects for the eclipse I saw a couple of those I think Didi those are cool uh, I saw one. I saw. I've been. I've been sleeping a lot. Um, it was uh, a collage that you did. It was really, really, really strong. Um, so yeah. So here's our page laid out. Here's everything. Um, <coughs> again, Didi, thank you at the beginning for the happy mail. Appreciate that very much. And and Lori and the kids, their grandkids, say thank you. So. All right, this is what I, uh, I'm i going to have done for you guys for tomorrow. But um, my voice is disappearing, and uh, I want it to be around. So I think I better sign off for today. Um, I'm happy I made it go so long. Now, oh, yeah, no, I, I showed it at the beginning, Didi, and I have plans for this. I got plans, Didi, plans. 
Oh snap. Um, thank you. Uh, yeah, I think I'm going to sign off today. Thanks very much, everybody, for coming and hanging out and, uh, and, and all these sort of fun things I wanted to show you. Um, I'll be uh, back on the regular now, uh, having got through uh, some of these things that I had to get done. And then, of course, you know, being sick. So I'll be back doing streams regularly again. And uh, I hope that uh, everybody has a great day today. And uh, I've got, uh, yeah, I'm really excited. I'm just rejuvenated now when you come out of being laid out. It tends to really stir up your energy to wanting to get producing stuff again. So by all means, and for those of you who join late, please uh, please feel free to go back and check out some of the stuff at the earlier. I showed about 10 pages and uh, some books and some, some art stuff. Um, Jim says he doesn't believe in the eclipse. Well, just wait, Jim. You just wait for it to happen. Well, Barbara says, I wish you a better tomorrow, Christopher. Take care all. Great rest of your day, everyone. Bye-bye. Okay, thanks very much, everybody. Uh, I've had a great time, and uh, I'll be back at 2 p.m. EST tomorrow. Bye for now.